Hello and welcome to CDA Oasis. My name is Shiraz Gesaye. We continue our implant series with Dr. Paul Belziki, and this is episode three. Dr. Paul Belziki is a dental surgeon from Toronto and has kindly accepted to share four decades of invaluable clinical experience and evidence with his Canadian dentist colleagues. And we are grateful to him for doing that. Dr. Belziki, as usual, welcome to CDA Oasis. It's a pleasure to see you again. Thank you very much. I'm a little bit under the weather. It's been five weeks of bronchitis, but I'll manage as best as I can. We, we hope you get well soon. Mm. So um, as usual, I always ask you this question before we go and see the, the presentation. What are the main takeaways that you'd like uh, your uh, colleagues to, uh, to keep with them from this presentation? Okay, I know that the focus on this is implants, but whether it's implants or any other type of dentistry. As far as I'm concerned, it's all the same. From every phase, from, from your diagnosis, record keeping, right to the very last time you, you tighten down that set screw, everything has to be treated with a high degree of attention to detail. Because in dentistry, that's all it is. Just a multiplicity of little details. You have to knock off each one as best as you can to end up with a successful result. You just don't back into it by accident and say, oh, look, isn't this great? You have to plan for it and make sure that you carry out everything to the best of your capabilities. So and I know it, 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 it's the same theme in any type of dentistry. It's all attention to detail. And I know you do that very diligently. So shall we go and see the presentation? Yes, we shall. So welcome back to the series of implants. And I, I see my role as um, just sh sharing my experience with implants, the various things I've bumped up against uh, in the course of a long career. And it's often the problems that we do bump into aren't explicitly addressed during formal education because the permutations of how problems can arise are far too numerous. So every case has its own peculiarities uh, and every case, as I've often said, has a weak link and you have to find and manage that weak link. And this comes down to clinical experience. It's using the knowledge gained from previous experiences, previous failures, if you will, as a guide to solve problems with odd presentation. And of course, as always, I'm doing it old school. I'm uh, VPS impressions, usually porcelain fused to metal restorations. And these are things that, that I have very much hands on and grind myself uh, when I get it back from the lab. So just to start on a case, this is an 85 year old female, otherwise in good health. And she's actually the mother of a classmate of mine that lives out in Vancouver and the mother lives here. And some 20 years ago, she had this implant case done by prosthodontists out in Vancouver and it is holding up quite nicely. And that bites against a lower conventional three unit bridge. And back in 2015, when I first met her, this is how it looked. Uh, after a few months, she returned and she claimed that the tissue around these implants was a little tender. And I think I could detect a faint rock. And, and I figured maybe the set screws had come loose or maybe she got food stuck underneath. So whenever possible, try to use design into your restorations, screw retention, because then you can retrieve these things at a later date. And here I did pull it off. Uh, these two implants were, as you obviously, screw retained. And this one was cement retained. It looks like a stock abutment of some kind. And whatever cement was there, I don't know if the other gentleman that put it in had cement there or was just on the post, but everything came out nice and clean. And this is why, as I stated earlier, porcelain fused to metal. I love this material because over the course of some 40 years of practice, it's proven itself to me to be robust and durable. So it's just a matter of popping it off and cleaning it up. 
and I could see that the interface here, everything looked very good, very clean. And that's what porcelain fused to metal gives you. I'm not 100% sold on, on a zirconia as, as a complete structure. I've seen it fail, uh, porcelain fused to metal. I can sleep with that, knowing that it will hold up over, over decades. I flushed the area out, cleaned around the implants as best as I could. Didn't want to open anything up. I didn't think there was that need. Just flush, cleaned everything out, and then re, reinserted the bridge. And whenever possible, or all the time, make sure that you use new screws, new fixation screws. Because if it was loose, uh, cyclic, chronic fatigue over a course of time will change uh, the metallurgy and you can end up with a, with a screw that fractures. So make sure you use new set screws whenever you re reintroduce the prosthesis onto the implants. And it was screwed down into place, the tissue healed and everything was wonderful. And then she came back about a year or so later and I could notice there was a lot of decay. There was a lot of decay in this area. And the treatment plan was to section the major connector between the retainer and the pontic, remove this and see is this tooth restorable or not. And it looked pretty bad. I mean, I, I've gone after and restored really bad looking teeth, but this one was a no-go. There was no need to involve that retainer because it was secure. So the tooth was extracted and a few months went by and she was referred on to Dr. Victor Monkars here. He's an oral surgeon, uh, one, one of the few colleagues I deal with now that's older than me. And he's got a lot of experience with implants and they have a very, very good rapport with that office. So a pan was taken and then the question always is, Where's Big Red? Where is that large neurovascular bundle that we all want to avoid? So the patient uh, had 3D scanning done, and this is the information that I get back from them that I can look at these things. And if I need to, they will send me the files. I'm not placing the implants, so that information is more important to them. But I do get this, and I've, you can see here, this is very neat to have because it shows you the width of the ridge. This is in a transverse plane. As you go from, uh, from back to front, it shows you the thickness of the ridge, which is quite nice. And then you can identify the neurovascular bundle. And this image is neat too, I assume, if you're an oral surgeon, because it gives you an idea of what that bone looks like before you raise a flap. But I deal, I deal with, with real people and I need to relate the digital realm to the organic realm, if you will. So I take study models, mount these in the office, and take nothing more sophisticated than a little millimeter ruler, snap a picture, and I send this to Victor. And I say, Vic, taking into consideration the width of bone, that obviously he can see on the scan, where would you like the holes? Where do you want the guide holes to, to be? And we'll discuss it, he phones me back, or we'll meet at his office, and said, okay, from, from the bicuspid back, seven millimeters, so we'll park it here, and then eight millimeters here, and we'll put a hole there. So that was done. And uh, this shell was fabricated by the lab, uh, by my lab, and I always tell them, don't put the guide holes in. That's my job. My job in conjunction with the surgeon. And I attend these surgeries, as I've said in the past, and I'll say, Victor, is this okay? Now that you see the model in your hands, let's put the slot in, and it just takes a few minutes to do that. So for me, this phase is very, very important. It gives me a hands-on feel for what problems I might fall into. It's almost as if you're doing a dry run. I attend the surgeries, these are the photographs I've taken, and indeed the holes were placed where it was agreed upon. And then that's, uh, those are Victor's fingers, Dr. Monkars, and you know, 45 years of experience, 
there's a tactile feel he has there to drive this home into place with a lot of confidence. So the other reason I'm, I attend is, is because I love to get these pictures. I want to know what that implant looks like the second it was driven into place. In case there's a problem down the road, you take a radiograph, you scratch your head, geez, what do I compare this to? Having a photograph of what it looked like the second it was inserted, I think is very, very valuable. Just as, as a follow-up, there's the radiograph of the implants in place. And I remember this conversation very, very well with Victor. He put in the, uh, before he put the cover screws in, he said, what kind of screws, cover screws, healing caps do you want? Flat or transcutaneous? So I said, well, you know, I, if it were me, I would like flat cover screws that you can bury under the tissue. Then it'll heal quietly. It won't be attacked by bacteria. And that's the way Branamark developed it. Let's do it that way. And he said, well, Paul, studies show that you can put transcutaneous abutments in if everything is secure and it should heal just as well. And given the fact she's 85 years old, we can then avoid a second stage surgery. And I thought that was a good argument. And he said that because I know, I mean, his tushy is on the line with this too. So I don't think he would do anything that would want to jeopardize these implants. So it was closed up with these transcutaneous abutments. And for about one month, the patient was in considerable pain and discomfort. And this is just a photograph from uh, her daughter had come, visited her from Vancouver, snapped this picture and said, you know, my mother's suffering. The tongue is bothering her. And this is from her smartphone. And indeed, there was an area that was thickened. She was placed on antibiotics after the surgery. I mean, she, did, she was complaining of discomfort early on, and we thought merely this was part of the healing phase. But as it turned out, it was a problem with soft tissue anatomy. The floor of the mouth spills over onto the healing caps and somehow she's irritating it. Or it could be some idiosyncratic behavior where she feels some rough edge and she keeps playing with it and banging against it. So the decision was made, let's take those healing caps out after a month and put in the regular flat cover screws. And I got a call back, and that was done. I got a call back from uh, Dr. Farber, Victor's partner, and he said, Paul, you know, I was turning it down, and the implants were spinning. And this is an example of sometimes you do everything right, and you can have a problem. And sometimes you stretch the envelope, and you do something, uh, oh, you know, you're stretching it, and everything turns out okay. And this was such a case. Uh, the healing caps were put in, the tissue was closed, and almost immediately she felt, she felt that the pain had gone away. So with that, it went on to heal for six months, and she had the second stage surgery, and then she came in after a couple of weeks of some healing with, the again, the transverse screws that were put into place. And on presentation, the tissue looked beautiful, but the pain had recurred the second they put these components in. And I thought to myself, how could these flat, very smooth, nondescript components cause such a big problem? I don't know whether when she bites down, it was pushing the skin against the metal, or if she just kept playing with it. 85, 86 years old, I, I'm unaware of the idiosyncratic behavior she may have had at home. So I thought, I have to know what restoration, what contour of restoration, the shape, the geometry of it, what will prove successful? If these two little things bother her, what am I going to make that won't? So as far as I'm concerned, the best thing for me to do now is, is uh, construct chairside provisionals, which she'll wear and give me some inf information. So on the day of impression taking, I had, and, and again, as I've, I've said, uh, custom trays, VPS impression material. Uh, I made up two of these. I needed two working models, one that I would keep here 
and provide provisionals and the other one would go off to the lab. So a hole is cut where I think the, the uh, transfer copings will pop out of, They're, they are in place on the implants. And I, I took some methyl methacrylate, uh, and this is in, this, in the doughy putty stage, and just parked it there, removed it before it's set, and then just hollow ground. Uh, loosen that up so that when I took the impression, these came out passively and I could readily, readily reach them to loosen them up before you pop off the tray. And there you can see the transfer copings in place. Put in a couple of analogs. And now it's time to pour the model up in stone. Now with VPS impression material, it's very, very important to soak this impression in hot water for 15 to 20 minutes before you pour it up. Because during that time, as the material heat, as the material sets, it degasses hydrogen. And you get these little bubbles forming on the, on the surface. I'm not sure if that's visible on the screen. But you do get this myriad of bubbles as the material degasses. Uh, putting it in hot water accelerates that set. And then uh, you take it out, you wipe your finger along here, you put it back in hot water, and then once you get to the point where you don't see bubbles forming, you can pour it up. Because those bubbles will be captured on a stone model and the surface will be, will be highly irregular. So it, impressions were, the, it was poured up, and there's the model. I figured the best, the best way to start is just take a preoperative study model, and I did a vacuform shell, I'll cut away the excess, but this is the component that I need to use as a matrix to make the provisionals. I hope you can see it here in place on the model. These are non-engaging metal uh, provisional abutments. The vacuum form shell is put on top. Two little holes are cut into it. I take the vacuum, I take the shell off, fill it with, met with methyl methacrylate, pop it back on. I did occlude the little holes here with some plasticine. I had put Vaseline on the surface so the acrylic wouldn't stick to the model. And then the acrylic, the, the acetate sheet that I use specifically will not bond or bind to, to the resin, which is very, very important. And then it was a matter of pulling it off and then taking some time to trim this anatomy here. The emergence profile, which everybody's talking about, what emergence profile will be harmonious with the patient's physiology? Um, I've often said trial and error is the best way to learn. So after 40 years of carving every provisional I've ever put in, I know in all likelihood what's going to work won't, uh, and what won't, what, what will impinge on tissue, what will be too big that'll pack food. I don't think you can read about this. I don't think you can Google it. You just have to have a feel of trial and error. So I inserted this and just put a little bit of cabin in the holes. And I was worried. I mean, I snapped this picture off just as I had inserted it. And right away I could see that the tissue from the floor of the mouth was already on the occlusal surface and I didn't feel too good about it. But I tried to replicate what was there before. And this took me uh, about 15, 20 minutes to carve. You needed some time to allow the material to set. So and you need an hour or two to do this effectively. The patient called the next morning claiming to be comfortable and able to eat properly. Since the extraction of the bridge segment half a year ago, or we needed time for healing. So I guess it's been almost a year. For the first time in a long time, she was comfortable. And I, I, I locked in. So this in-office pr procedure is invaluable as it supplies information of what design will prove successful for the final restoration. I can now guide the lab properly because I have evidence of what will work. The patient had a dry run for a few weeks here. You know, you're biting, you're not biting, you're biting your cheek, your tongue, let me know, and we'll make adjustments as we go along. 
because you don't want to get a, a restoration back and then realize it's not right because that's expensive and time consuming to reconfigure it. Now, I've used sentences in the past about making the, pros the prosthetic endeavor, making the restorations harmonious with patients' physiology and psychology. It's a highfalutin statement. But here, this is proof. This is all I need to see. When I pulled those temporaries off and I could see this cuff of tissue did not bleed. Yes, it's a little bit red here because you end up disrupting that hemidesmosomal attachment to the foreign body. You, you do end up ripping that off and there must be some bacteria, but the tissue was fairly pink and healthy. So the body's telling me you did it right. And so I know going forwards, I know what design will work. On uh, the working model that the lab had, they went ahead and fabricated a metal framework. I always have, when I'm doing PFMs, I always have the metal framework back without porcelain because that's the best way that I can assess, is this, is this the shape and the fit that I want? I have to make sure that I'm not compressing tissue up against the natural tooth. I want the embrasure open. Uh, now you have to recognize here that this was the impression I took the first time. The cuff of tissue did grow into that quite nicely. So it would still allow the patient to get a bristle brush in between these areas because home care is vitally important these things. And an impression was taken, taken to make sure it fit properly. Uh, another point here is that the lab, my lab technician, very knowledgeable, a little bit inventive. Typically you're told if you're using multiple units, splinted units or a bridge, that you should have non-engaging components. And what he did in this case is he used a component that didn't engage into the implant and one that was non-engaging. And this is kind of neat because it helps me center the restoration into the implants quite nicely and does give, does give a good amount of security. Uh, he'll often, if he feels it's a little bit too tight, I assume he might have been able to use two engaging components, uh, but then the, the implants have to be near parallel. So in this case, he just engaged one. This is non-engaging, and it was, it was very, very neat. And just going back to this, I did want to smooth out some of the bulk of the metal here, which is what I did. I sent it back, and the porcelain was applied. This is the day of insertion. And again, the tissue is telling me I nailed it. The tissue says you got it right. And it was just a matter of inserting or fitting this restoration up against a tooth. Now, contacts. Contacts with implants are a killer because the tolerance that's required between too tight that it doesn't go to place 100% or too loose, too slack that you get food stuck, the tolerances are extreme. So it takes a lot of time and effort, and you have to delegate a lot of time to trying this in and out, in and out, uh, putting some dye indicating material on the mesial surface of the restoration, trying it in, tightening the screw down a little bit, testing with floss. Is there, an, is there resistance that it won't go through? And you just have to keep dusting off little by little by little until there is resistance and it snaps through. And then you stop, take, an, take a radiograph and make sure that the components are all seated properly. So it's not a slap dash. Oh, I finally got it back. Let me torque it down. You have to keep on top of these contacts. And contact management between an implant in a, and a natural tooth is one problem. At least with a bicuspid, has a periodontal ligament. It, there can be a little bit of give and maybe remodeling. But when you have implants 
or crowns on implants where the crowns are separate, dialing in those contacts, I find is, is takes takes a lot of time. It's it's tight enough, not too tight, and not too slack. So the patient was sent away initially. I torqued it down to the proper settings, and it was initially sent away with Cabot. Patients always return two, three weeks later, pull the Cabot out and retorque and check the torque settings to make sure nothing's backed off. Then I'll put in some final composite resin restoration. And the tissue after, this is about six, seven months later, she came back for a recall. And the tissue from the buckle and the tissue from the lingual, everything was just fine and dandy. And it ended up being a successful case. Now, the point I'm trying to make is in dentistry, geometry is everything. You can't have restorations that are too bulky. They can't impinge on soft tissue or hard tissue structures. And as being diligent to manage that geometry, I think is an important key to long-term success. So this patient, we had to lose a, a tooth here. It was endodontically treated. And even with the crown, it ended up cracking. So an implant was placed, stone models were taken, and I always ask the lab, send me pictures of what the wax up looks like. And in this case, it will be a screw retained crown. And I thought, okay, you may, as usual, too much meat, too fat, because my lab technician tells me everybody doesn't want dark triangles. Like even if it's, you know, the sevens or the eights, they want everything closed up and shut down. I don't like that. I want everything wide open so they can pass a brush through there. So this is what came back to me. Didn't bother trying it in initially. So I just spent some time with the green stone and other abrasives, making a tulip shape that I know from experience will prove harmonious with the patient's soft tissue. Doing a lot of perio makes me, you know, makes me quite quite attentive to the soft tissue. And then that was inserted. And I took a great deal of time and effort to respect the anatomy of bone and the soft tissue. On insertion, I could tell the tissue was a little bit tight, it blanched a little bit. So I just went and I made very shallow, four little radial cuts it, it doesn't go down to periosteum, just, just halfway through the tissue, just to loosen it up, give the tissue a little bit of give. And when I insert it, you can see there was a little bit of blanching here. Uh, some temporary material, she goes away a few weeks later, comes back, torque settings were spot on, and then put the restoration in. So geometry is very important. Here's a case where that little small attention to detail wasn't considered. This is a new patient to me, came in a, a couple of weeks ago. He's been with a dentist for 25 years, had a lot of dentistry done, all of it to a very high standard. Just, it, just beautiful work. But this implant was put in about two, three years ago. And the patient claims, well, I'm, I'm packing a little bit of food here. I, it doesn't bother me until I eat meat. And I, and I can feel it. And often people will ask me, well, why are you taking so much time? What's taking so much time with these contacts? And I said, look, if it's too loose, first corned beef sandwich is all going to pack into that area. And of course, I could see a little bit of decay on the root surface. So I knew I was going to have to place a new crown. Unfortunately, this crown is cement retained. I assume this is a, a zirconia over, over a screw and abutment. So I really don't want to sacrifice that. So I can't address that area here easily or without cost to the patient. So my, uh, ch my challenge is to just make a new crown here. Then I can incorporate the decay that's on the root surface and, and the notching that's taken place. This, is, this crown's about 20 years old. Here's another case where it was just over contoured. I saw this patient in June. She was complaining that the implant had come loose a second time. So I asked her, when was the first time it came loose? And she said, beginning of the year. 
uh, with a previous dentist out of town where she was living. Now she's living in Toronto. She'd relocated and she came to my office. So I phoned the referring dentist and I said, could you get me a radiograph of what this looked like back in January? And he did. So he uh, had retightened a loose screw. The implant was loose, sorry, the screw was loose or the crown was loose and he, he retightened it. Now, it got loose again, and it's been loose for some months. And now I can see in these areas, I have a significant amount of bone loss that's happened in the course of, in the course of a short period of time. I removed the crown completely because it was screw retained. And the tissue looked reasonable. I mean, it's not that there was a lot of blood or a lot of exudate nothing the tissue looked relatively good now what can could have caused that i've had instances and again i'm not well read in the literature i'm a, i'm a wet wet glove not wet fingered i'm a wet glove dentist and, and and just in my mind that little bit of micro movement is just enough to somehow disrupt the tissue attachment against the, the crown and perhaps microbes are just pumped down into the area around the implant so the the treatment i thought would be best is first of all she's got to go back to the oral surgeon that's responsible for the implant let him address that area if he wants to flap it clean it put in whatever magic bone dust is available what's 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 in vogue now but I've, I got this crown, crown out and I thought best that I just make a tulip shape again, just to clean that up so that the patient can get in and around the implant with a water pick, which is, which is really, really good for cleaning these difficult areas. She's an older lady, so that manual dexterity is always a problem. So I ended up just uh, making making uh, this shape, as you can see, this is before and this is after. So this, right now, that as it was, this surface was right up against the tissue. In this case, the tissue in this area was free and more readily accessible. She was sent back to the oral surgeon without me putting the crown back in. And there you can just see the comparison of how this was how this was carried out. And this is another very important point. When a patient comes in with a screw retained restoration that's loose, don't merely tighten it down with the old screw. You don't know how much cyclic fatigue those threads have been exposed to. And here I could see shiny surfaces. I know that there's been some galling taking place, and this has just been slack banging around now it's very easy and cheap to replace the screw it's a lot more expensive and difficult to replace an implant so what do what does the threading look like on the interior of the implant and i was also told by a representative from noble biocare that on their screws there is some film akin to a high-tech loctite that they apply to the threading so the first one or two times you tighten it down it provides some additional friction against backing off. It's gone in these cases. So the point is, it's an important point, if something comes loose, get a new screw, uh, just for that bit of Loctite if it's there, and you don't know what the metallurgy is like now that it's been stressed for several, several months. In closing, uh, being a quasi mentor and talking to a lot of young dentists, I get questions. I want to get into implants. I want to get into implants. How do I do that? And I know that there was a recent post done by Mike Rasich a month or two ago addressing this. And I'd like to refer everybody back to that because he covered it quite nicely. So I don't feel I have to, but I will put in my two cents. Implant dentistry is just another spectrum of the work I do. So the points I will make here 
it's not just specific to implants. It's to everything we do. Tissue management, carving, uh, trimming preparations, and things of that sort. Success. I've said before, success is a chain of events that are all linked together. And every link has to be carried out in a proper sequence and to a high degree of exactness for you to achieve success. Every case has a weak link. Every case there's hinges on something important. And it's important to identify that and manage it. So what can cause a, a failure or for that matter success? Well, there's a dentist contribution, what we bring to the table, and there's the patient contribution. So what we bring to the table is our knowledge. And I've tried to stress before, don't rely on sales reps, don't rely on gurus. You have to do a certain amount of trial and error on your own so that knowledge becomes internalized. So that shape that is required, you're not going to Google it. You're not going to find it on the internet. It has to be within you. And the only way to do that is picking up a sandpaper disc and start carving acrylic. It's the methodologies that, uh, that, are, that are used, no cutting corners, following step by step, and it's the skill set that you develop over time and the materials you use. You can have wonderful knowledge, wonderful methodology, great skills, great hands, but if you choose an inappropriate material, and for me, I mean zirconia, I do use a lot of single crowns in the anterior that are zirconia, but for large bridge work on implants, I want to have porcelain or porcelain fused to metal. So control of the lab phase is very important. You can't accept everything that's given to you, even if it's done by a computer. You have to tell that computer the shape that you want. And it's the philosophy of care that you employ. What type of dentist are you? Is it, hey, it gets past the lips, it fits? Or are you going to sweat it and get gray hair like me? And this comes down to just encompassing all of this comes down to what my mentor always said, Dr. Blake McAdam, brinksmanship, brinksmanship, being proud of what you do, taking a lot of pride in the hard work you put in for success for the patients. And many, many of my patients have been with me for most of their life. What the patient's contributions are is their physiology, their overall physiology. Some of this we can't control. Bacterial load, what type of bacteria, difficult to control. And then there's their psychology, which is beyond our control. Some patients are nice, some aren't so nice. What's their degree of rationality? What are their expectations? Are they reasonable expectations? And are, there, are they expectations that you as a dentist feel you have the skills to accomplish? You have, to, you have to measure all of that. Level of home care is very, very important. And it's their honesty and commitment. Like how committed are they to success? So everybody involved must be emotionally invested in trying to succeed. It's just not going to happen on its own. There are no shortcuts to success. And boys and girls, that's doing it old school. I'm totally amazed I could spend this amount of time without coughing. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.